The Simon Filer Podcast, giving authors a platform. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Bev Ryan joins me today. Bev is the owner of smartwomenpublish.com, helping writers on their journey. Uh, however, Bev is so much more a book coach, an author, a magazine publisher, workshop facilitator, speaker, presenter, and a former English teacher. Welcome to the Simone Filer <laughs> podcast, Bev. <laughs> Thanks, Simone. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, awesome to have you here. Such an incredible collection to your portfolio, Bev. And looking forward to uh, breaking it down and hearing all yeah. about it. Well, I have to say that spread over quite a long time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah of course. You haven't just crammed it all in no, yesterday. No, it doesn't all happen at the moment. <laughs> no, uh, success doesn't happen overnight, that's yes. for sure. So I thought we'd start by going back a little way to why you decided to become an English teacher. Yeah, that's a long time ago. And it's not a very exciting story. I, I won a scholarship to oh. go to university, put it that way. Awesome. And because of my level of scholarship, I had a limited choice of uh, courses and the Bachelor of Arts Diploma of Education was one of my choices. So that's the one I, I went down that path. Oh, that you must have done, had outstanding results at school then. Oh, uh, they were, they weren't, there was a higher level of scholarship, which meant open, you know, choose any path. So I, I did okay, but yeah, yeah, I think that's a great result. It was, it was a good time back then for education back in the 70s three unis there for a while yeah um, scholarships bring back mm. those days mm, definitely. We're, we're a far cry from there right De now aren't yes. we so um how, did you enjoy teaching how was that for you i did love teaching i loved parts but I, I did a total of seven years and um the, the element of teaching that i loved was making um relationships with the kids individually yeah earning their trust and then seeing them as individuals get their confidence. I didn't like the discipline of large groups. I really, and the unnecessary nitpicking of uh, tucking shirts in and pulling socks up. That you know that I used to, that used to drive me crazy. <laughs> did they get away with it then with you? Uh, with me, they did. Yes. <laughs> a little bit. Like, like, who cares? I just want to <laughs> go and teach them something and have a conversation that matters. <laughs> yeah, every school kid would have loved you then, saying, <laughs> "Miss won't mind." <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All right. Well, teaching together with being a mum of four must have been incredibly demanding for you, so much so that you were driven to a crossroad and fortunately came across that book by Barbara Sher. I could do anything if only I knew what it was. Yes. That's such a cool title. So tell me a little bit about the book and how it led you to that new door. It was such a pivotal book. And the one thing I love about doing, you know, helping other people do publish books now is that I can truthfully say, look, your book may change someone's life because you know, that one book really changed everything that I did. And I'm sure everybody's got the book in their life that stood out for them and uh, for all different reasons. I just found someone with a voice that I really connected with who was talking about um, career change basically and finding that really difficult process of identifying what you really love to do and having them processes and the methodologies to figure out how to go and do that even if you've never done it before Barbara Sher, that's what she's all about she passed away a couple of years ago but her work has really had a huge impact on a lot of people and still does to this day I still recommend her books to people oh awesome have you reread it again or was um, it just the once that first one I read that one first um, because it was a new release at the time goes going back to the 90s I guess and she mentioned her, a former book called Wishcraft, which she wrote earlier. Um, I do read that parts of that from yeah from time to time, and I do refer that book to a lot of people because that's the book that's got the strategies or the things you can do to find out what you want to do next and how you can get started on with no money or how you can get over the fear factor. And it's a really practical book. Yeah, mm. and it sounds very timely. It's, it's probably timeless, oh. actually. It's very timeless, yes. There's a lot of people have been influenced by her work and they are running businesses now, career coaching businesses based on all you know, much of her work early work that she yeah. did mm. it's so good to see like she was probably one of the pioneers in the industry maybe or well, in the 90s certainly getting up to it there's a lot of people now mm. that you know say you got to start doing what you love because working mm. takes up so much time mm. that if you're not doing what you love it's not very much fun at all yeah i think she was 
Like her first book, I think she wrote, it might have even been the 70s, Wishcraft. I should check on that. Wishcraft, not witchcraft. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Got to get that right. Wishcraft, there, there's a difference there. <laughs> yes, yes. All right. Well, forward to 1997 and then you embarked on a self-publishing your first magazine. So um, it was called Work From Home. Tell us how this all came together and a little bit about the magazine. Well, that that is what came from my uh, reading of Barbara Scher's material and just identifying all the really simple little things that I like to do. And if I could do those things in a day, what would that career look like? So I put together the things that I was good at and the things that I like to do. And I was at a conference actually or a seminar and somebody mentioned magazines in Australia about home-based business because it, there was, this is again, late nineties, more and more people wanted to work from home. We were starting to get computers in our homes. Um, and somebody just mentioned that there was only one magazine in Australia about home-based business. And I thought oh, that was sort of a light bulb moment is I could start the second one. So using Barbara Scher's strategies of studying something that I've never done before and having no contacts whatsoever and not knowing what to do, I just went through the steps that uh, helped me figure out what I needed to do and um, got a distribution contract without even producing a magazine and wow. then went, went from there. Yeah. So it was obviously mm. in demand, that topic, and you were right on top of it. Yeah, I spoke to a publishing, you know, a magazine distribution company and told them my idea, and they just said, that sounds really good, let's do it. So Fantastic. Mm. Was it one publication or more? No, I did quarterly issues for about three years. It was called Work From Home, and again, late 90s, so, you know, it's very timely. It's, I mean, it's sort of a... a um, Pioneer. Topic. Yeah, I was a pioneer. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's sensational. I guess I remember the computer mm. coming in. There would have been a lot of people thinking we can do this from mm. home now. Well, I was a mum of four. My kids are you know, spread out over about 12, 13 years. Um, but I was a mum of four and I had a lot of friends who were mums and, you know, all of us wanted to be able to work from home. So I thought, well, there must be lots of other people who want to do the yeah, same. Yeah, so. fantastic. Mm. Well, I'm sure you helped a lot of people then maybe well, work hopefully, from home. Hopefully some of them. <laughs> yeah. Have you got the old copies? I've got one copy of each. I did it for three years and in that time, uh, my marriage broke up late in that time. Um, that can often sometimes be a consequence of finding your thing, finding your purpose, finding... I hear you. ...challenge relationships. Um so I ended up handing the magazine over to another publishing company who kept going. I was the editor for, with them for about a year, but that was it was quite difficult because I wasn't the owner anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah it would so, have been hard to yeah. separate. But you were going on to bigger and be better things. Oh, well, <laughs> didn't feel like it at the time. No, you were letting go <laughs> of your baby. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> you had five babies, really, yeah. didn't you? <laughs> so 10 years later, you published your second magazine, which yeah. was an award-winning women's magazine. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on that. Uh, Honestly, woman. Tell me a little bit more about this. Well, I started that one in 2006. Um, Came back to magazine publishing. The first one was was black and white pages, which made it quite uh, inexpensive to print. But the second one, I thought I'd go colour. Um, it was very satisfying. It was more of a financial drain because of the colour printing. Uh, but again, I did it quarterly. Um, interesting articles. My whole mantra was no, no fashions, diets or celebrity because... I, I knew I couldn't compete with big magazines. There's no way because, you know, the, the cost of producing big magazines is horrendous. And Ida had tried and Ida didn't succeed. Mm. So um, I just kept it low key, um, quarterly. And, you know, I know it satisfied uh, a s demand for magazines that, for older women or mature women that don't go down that celebrity road and don't have... Um, 12 year olds modeling clothes yeah you know so i, I just did that for what do you mean another for real women <laughs> i did that for another three years and then gfc hit so oh. it was a big decision again i didn't walk away from something um but that you know that was okay yeah well well done that was also probably a tricky time because of the internet a lot of people don't really and particularly now read magazines as much as i remember my mum reading in the in the mm. 90s and now Pretty much the, all the, that information is on online, mm. isn't it? Yeah, I mean that was always you know, a lot of people suggested I'd take it online, but 
I mean, I did I did an online version for a little while after that, but um, it's very hard to sell advertising in online. I I just find that selling advertising is is basically where your money comes from, and it's I never liked the fact that I couldn't guarantee a result or return on on someone's investment in advertising. Yeah. It's just not something that's not my favourite thing. Yeah. yeah. That's a good thing. All right. Well, so after you've done that, you launched your boutique one-stop publishing service. Is that right? Have I got it in sequence? Yes. Yes. The sort of slowly, once I stopped the magazine, I've always sort of done a couple of things in my career. And I think out of doing the Barbara Sherwood work, I identified two things. Um, I was interested in publishing and I was also interested in career coaching because that's what helped me through her books. So I did... I did go down that path as well, so I trained as a career coach. Up until about two years ago, I've always done a little bit of both. Okay. Um, the publishing has been busy for, at times, and then, then I've become busy with career coaching. And, and it's kind of, I like the way that having two different interests can mean that your life is varied and interesting. Yeah. yeah. But at the moment, as of a couple of years ago, I'm just doing books. Right. So what sort of things did you do with your career coaching, though? Uh, the main uh, thing that I did, I, well, I became a career coach when I was living down south in Wollongong for a time, working in an employment program. So the organisation I was working with funded my career coaching training. So I was working with what they call a mature workers program, helping people over 40 because that's what they classed as wow. mature age. Then. How it's, it's changed. Um, <laughs> helping them find work. So that was a government-funded program in New South Wales for many years. Yeah. Um, since I came back to, a, or after I came back to Queensland, I worked with consulting companies. So I would just be one of their consultants going into work with people who'd been made redundant, right. helping them find their next job or change their career or whatever. Oh, mm. still helping people. Mm. That's what you've been yes. doing all your life. Yeah, that's the, very that's satisfying. The theme. That's the, the, the thread that holds it all together. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Well, I guess congratulations are in order because you kind of kicked off all of that and you've been doing your own business basically since mm. those magazines, since that mm. crossroad was there in front of you. Um, but now Smart Women Publish – You've mm -hmm. got a great website up there, and I've worked with many of your authors, or a few of mm, your authors mm, that have yes. come in to make audiobooks. Tell us more about your business and mm -hmm. what you do in it and why people should come and see you to, to publish. Obviously, you cover it, all aspects, mm -hmm. so I'll leave it up to you rather than telling you what you might okay. do. <laughs> That's why you're here. Well, you, you asked before about getting, um, getting involved in helping people publish books. I think that was the transition from project managing my own magazines to eventually realising I could help other people project manage book production, really similar skills. Um, so I started off with book production. Then recently, I think last year, I, I became a certified book coach through a um, very reputable American company. So that now I feel very competent helping people plan their books and work with them as they write their books if that's what they need. And then with the book production, I've got a team of um, freelance designers and editors that do that work with me. So I basically project manage the production end as well. So I might have clients who just come in and do book coaching with me. So they get their books planned out and then they start to write. Um, and they may go somewhere else for the book production end. Or uh, one of my clients last year secured a publishing contract with a publishing company. So they are doing the production some other clients might just come to me when they've written their book and I'll just work with the editing, graphic design. I've got about six books on the go at the moment, all in that stage, and others will work with me the whole way through. I've got one client who we're now just working on her book production, but she's worked with me right through the book coaching, the writing and the and the production. So I get to, and they're all non fiction books, so I get to work with really, really interesting people. Not all women. I've, I have worked with several men on their books over the last couple of years. And um, they're always interesting people who've achieved interesting things and always got good hearts. And um, they're writing their books for for themselves, but also for their readers. You know, they've got a message they want to share. And I'm always learning new content but by reading through, you know, reading the books, always learning new things. It's yeah. quite fascinating. Yeah, mm. I totally understand mm. that. Mm. Uh, you know, it's a wonderful 
um, opportunity to learn stuff and, you know, you get to speak to the authors, mm. you know, in person. I get them reading their books to me. Yes. So it's amazing. Yes. Um, so any writer or any budding author that's listening to this, can they just come to you with an idea? Do they have to have mm. a manuscript or what's the deal? No, there? well, as a book coach, that's where I meet with people is when they have an idea. Or well, they may not even have an idea. They might just have a desire to write a book. I mean, it's a big dream for a lot of people to write and publish a book. It's apparently, I don't know where these statistics come from, but apparently it's something like 90% of people want to write a book and only wow. about 10% do. Right. So there's a big, you know, there's a big gap there of 80% of people who need really need some help, yeah. whether or not they are willing to commit to the undertaking. Because it is quite, you know, it's quite a lengthy uh, process and yeah. quite... Um, I actually heard, I heard that um, of that, mm -hmm. only 2% actually end up published. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's changed with self-publishing and mm -hmm. how that's grown. So Yeah, I would uh, like to think it's grown, but um, it's it's very interesting that, so that when, when people approach me and they either, generally speaking, they've got a business or a service of some kind. So then they probably want to write a book that's going to help grow their business or tell their message or and some people want to do that that memoir self-help combination which is really wanting to write their own story but they want to write it in a way that's helpful to other people and that's always a lovely combination it has to be planned out fairly carefully so that they do achieve what they want to achieve because uh, a memoir that's of interest to a reader is really not just a chronological story of someone's life there's more to it there's transformation of the author how they change because these things happen to them and the author should also think about how their readers will be transformed by reading this story um, so that's that's mm. really important that it, that's planned out quite well so that's always an interesting process yeah so you can mm. help with that if yes any... yes as my, as my um, qualification as a book coach <laughs> yeah allows so with the uh, I work with non-fiction authors which does include that memoir self-help combination as well because memoir self is a memoir is a combination of knowing how to write a fiction write a house story which is part of kind of knowing how to write a fiction story even yeah. though it's not fiction yeah but the self-help component of that style of book is writing non-fiction writing information that's going to engage the reader so it's a kind of a mixture of those two and do people just call or do they call you or do you set up a meeting do you work in person or no, by Zoom or just by first, I always offer a free call, usually Zoom, because I I want people to meet me. I want to meet them as well. Sometimes I'll talk to people; they're not actually ready to write. They might just need to have a chat to see if their ideas are even worth pursuing. And um, I know one of your clients has recorded his book with you. We had a conversation a couple of years ago, just about that. He just wanted to talk to somebody to see if his ideas were worth putting it on paper and he, and he did that um, so I'm happy to have those sorts of conversations but if somebody's ready to I was looking for someone to work with it's really important to me that they know me and they actually choose to work with me I'm never going to sell myself to somebody because I don't want to work in that in that way you know if somebody meets me and they feel like well you're not the right person I've also got a part of I'm part of a huge network of book coaches through the accreditation process and there's some really amazing people in that community. So if I feel someone's not, you know, if someone needs somebody with different skills than what I've got, I'll refer them on to somebody else. So I'm always very happy to do that as well. Yeah, that's a, that's mm. a wonderful thing. Well, after you do the book coaching and sort of plan out everything and you go forward with them, what's, what's the next step that would happen? After the planning process? Yeah. Planning process? Planning process can be quite lengthy, and I think that's really important that people take the time to do that. There's sort of two versions of that. There's the, what we call the mini, the mini blueprint, which is a shorter process just for to help people get their ideas together and decide which book they're going to write, who it's for, what's the point they want the book to make, um, and to think about how they might structure it. Then the the longer version of the blueprint is to actually start working, maybe writing a couple of chapters as well. So sometimes that's all I'll do with somebody and then they feel confident to actually go and do the work and write the chapters. Uh, I've got a coaching client at the moment who's we meet twice a month. He's actually in America. He's writing his book slowly because he's a very busy businessman. 
but we'll catch up twice a month. So that's the, that's the ongoing writing coaching that I can assist with. When he's got material that he's finished, then I'll go through it. And it's very hard to review pieces of a document, but I certainly can review what I see. But then when the whole document is put together at the end as a manuscript for a book, that's a whole another review because sometimes when you see an individual piece out of context, it's hard to review it as to how, how it's going to function mm. within the book. So it's, it's Yeah, it's a very interesting process. Yeah, that's where I never even thought mm. of that. So, you know, putting it together gives it a completely mm. different vibe. Well, it can like. do, yeah. yeah. So that I had a client recently who wanted a developmental review. So she'd written a manuscript, tried to find a publisher, hadn't succeeded, and really wanted an in-depth review of the manuscript as a whole. And I went back to my coaching community uh, my book coaching community because I knew the people in there that really specialised in that kind of thinking. Um, so I matched her with somebody there and they did a great job with her. Yes, there's all sorts of components to writing a book. Some people will, won't will do that review stage. It really depends on whether people, partly people's finances, I suppose, and yes. time. If they want to publish something quickly, um, that's always a bit of a, a drama if someone wants to push something through too fast. Do you think it mightn't quite be ready? Well, not, no, um, it can be mistakes at the end that should have been picked up during yeah. the process. Yeah. And so then it has to be fixed up again. Yeah. I have, well, obviously I'm right at the end, although some people can now just put audiobooks straight up without having print, but um, I have a lot of specialises, you know, in author narration and some authors are like, there's so many mistakes in my book. Not not necessarily yours, but mm. it's every single book. So, mm. going through the editing, do you still do the editing, or you you have um, freelancers that edit for you? Yeah, I've got freelancers that edit for me. Unless something is very straightforward, then I, I will do it. But I'll always get a second set of eyes to go through it as well. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, my function in the process is to uh, sort of double check what somebody else has done, and there might be times where I'll pick up. Because even the best editors in, editors in the world might just miss something like Anne instead of and or whatever. Yeah, very true. Um, so I haven't yeah. found a book yet that hasn't had mm. a mistake in it. Mm. So, um, yeah. but yeah, that's a very hard thing, you know. Even mm. if it's twenty five thousand words, right up to a hundred thousand words yes. in the, yeah. you know, some of my authors say, "Oh, the words are leaping out." I try and do it in three hour sessions because the words do end up. You've got to concentrate. Mm. So I imagine, you mm. know, editing. Yes. Do you? Like when your editors are editing, do they spend hours on end or dedicate, like I'm going to concentrate on it for an hour, you know, so that you've got in peak concentration yeah. level there? Probably a couple of hours. I generally tell people editing of a manuscript, and I say the average 50,000 words, I will tell them it's going to take about four weeks. But that might be three weeks of the editor just being left alone and then sending back what they've come up with as suggestions then the author might need to go through that and then go. And then there'll be a final edit. So, yeah, it can be take... I'm, actually, there's another book I'm working on at the moment. We're still... The author is still making changes. This has been going on for a long time. So, right. Um, yes. Yeah. And, and what about rewrites then? Do you write... You know, sometimes you write something where you think it'll work and the author mm. says, yeah, and writes pretty mm. much exactly what they sent to you in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And is it how are the conversations with the authors then when you think, you know, I really think this would probably work better given your experience? And they're like, no. Nope. <laughs> yeah, that, that happens uh, because it's self publishing. So in the self publishing world, the author's paying the bills, they've, they've got the final say. That's right. Um, sometimes I'll have a client, not so much the editing, but I've had occasionally have a client who's got a really firm idea on the book cover that they want. And um, that can be difficult if their ideas doesn't look as good as it could actually look like they're selling themselves short by going down that path when the book cover could be so much better you know that happens occasionally because there is an industry standard really when it comes mm, to book covers mm. doesn't it and it's not about the money because this you know people have the money to pay for a designer it's something that they just have an idea in their head yeah. and they just can't let go of it yeah um, so that i think the book for them is they're not running the book for an audience they're running the book for their own satisfaction which is fine yeah, yeah fine. well there's some people that just want to do that you know mm. put out a book and give it to family and, mm. and friends and yeah. stuff um one of the hardest things i think in the publishing world is 
marketing and telling people that your book's out there. Mm. Do, do you have you got any tips about this? Oh, that's that's a huge question. Um, <laughs> I I don't get involved in the marketing side. I, I say that people do ask if I help market the books, but the point of that I'll take people to with the books is to have their files uploaded through a company called Ingram Spark. So the book is online. So the print book, ebook appears on booksellers, online booksellers. And it also is accessible to bricks and mortar bookstores. They can go into the catalogue and find it and order it in. So I'll take people to that point. I've recently done a website for an author because she's changing from one business to another. So we did her author website. I've got a PDF that's free that I send to people. It's quite a, it's kind of a checklist of all the different aspects of um, all the different things you could do to prepare to, to market your book. So that's quite useful. Yeah, um, I can help implement some of those things, but I think that checklist is really, really useful. So, I mean, if anybody wanted it, they could reach out to me and I'm happy to send it. It's a PDF. I just have to email to people. Oh, that's a wonderful mm -hmm. gesture. Thank you. So, well, before I let you go and find out your details where people mm -hmm. can contact you, um, if anyone's thinking about writing, why, why would you encourage them to write? Yeah, great question. I What I see happening with people who write a book, keeping in mind that I'm working with people who are, they're not authors by profession. They, they've got a, you know, they've got a business or they've got a career and they want to add the book to that. And most of the people I work with have not written books before. So what I see happening is what I call self-authorship, which is a real term. And it's really fascinating. Self-authorship is making decisions about yourself that form who you are and, and the person you become. Because writing a book in itself means that you're bringing together what you already know, but you're also bringing together or researching and learning more as you go. And you're making a lot of decisions about who you want the world to see you as when this book is published. Mm. So I always tell people, don't write the book as the person you are now. Write your book as the person you want to be in a year's time. And if you want that person to have their own business or be doing this or be a speaker or whatever, that person's got to write the book. That person's got to show up now and think like them and write like them because that's the book that's going to take you there. Wow, that so, is, that's mm, profound. That's mm, like the visualization thing, yes, you know, bringing meditation yes. and all of that in and visualizing. Definitely. Yeah. Because it's too many of us hold ourselves back. And if we're writing a book holding ourselves back, it's not going to be the book it could be. No. Because if you get into that headspace and, and that visualisation and, and the courage, that's the person I want to be. Well, that's the person that's got to show up when you're sitting at the keyboard. And that's huge. That That's why people should write a book. That That's what's going to happen. So it's, writing itself is, is transformational, personally transformational. Mm. And then what it can do for you professionally in terms of business or career can just take you places you don't even dream you could go. Opens doors and you know, people recognize you, praise you because you wrote a book. Um, I couldn't, when I did my very first magazine, I couldn't believe how differently people saw me when I said, I've got a magazine and it's in the bookshelf. It's like, oh my God, yeah. who are you? you know, it's, it, I was the same person. It was ridiculous. But writing a book, can yeah, do so much for people. So so what I see happening uh, in the work I do with people is this amazing personal growth and, and professional growth as well. So that's why I encourage people to write books. And, you know, it might be a slog. I know when I wrote my own book, which is called Smart Women Publish, funnily enough, and my business name came from the book, it was a slog. There was a time when I almost gave up and there were times when I doubted that I could do it. And then I... Actually, I went to a, a seminar about making decisions and it was all about, well, make a decision. Open your diary, put the time in your diary where you want to do whatever it is you're doing to make something happen and just make it happen, make a decision. So I did. So I blocked out times in my diary over the next few months. I went with my partner to the beach. I just wrote. He looked after me. <laughs> it was, you, sometimes you just got to do that to make something happen for yourself because most of us spend way too much time making things happen for other people. Yeah, true. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about your your book, Smart Women Publish, and how you came to the decision, I'm going to write a book. Was mm -hmm. Yeah, what was that about? I guess 
having people ask me if I'd written a book myself when I started, you know, when I started to do this work with authors, I was able to say, well, I've published lots of magazines and in many ways magazines are more complex because you've got authors and advertisers and articles and lots of things happening within a magazine. So I was quite confident I could manage production of a book. Um, but I always felt like I really should have a book to do things for me that I said <laughs> would do for everybody else. So Smart Women Published was just a title I, I really liked. So that's it's what I, it's really much it's very much a how to book. It's kind of my style is as I guess the teaching are in me that comes out is the, yeah. well I can tell you how to do it. So it's a, a book of the steps to take with exercises so that people can use a journal as they go through the book and they'll kind of journal the, the framework of the book. Mm. Uh, people's other other women's stories of what happened when they published their book. So it's the sort of book I wanted to read. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Or you wish you had when you first started. Maybe. Yes, yeah, and that's always a good uh, a good choice for a book is the book you wish you had have had when you're going through something. Yeah, yeah. Mm. and you did mention before that it's not just for women. Men mm. also have obviously got something out of it. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I do work with men. I, most of my work comes through referral. So usually if a man contacts me about a book, it's because one of my female clients has recommended me. So that's really nice. Right. That's awesome. Mm. Well, you mm. definitely are the full package, you know, and I love your reasons for encouraging people to write. That's mm. Amazing, the growth that they're going to go through, and mm. how you have to visualize where you're going to be when that book's released. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I just sort of add that I know writing a book's not for everybody. It's like painting's not for everybody. It's, it's. Yeah. But if somebody has the yearning to do it, which is usually like a burning little flame in your belly, if it's there and it won't go away, then I really encourage people to take notice of it. Oh, mm. fantastic! Well, how can people reach out to you? Where do they find you? Yeah, my website is smartwomenpublish.com. So it's smart women publish.com that's the fastest way to find me awesome mm. or look up bev ryan on google bev ryan. yeah i should come up yeah. and or linkedin awesome mm. yeah. thank you so much for coming in and sharing you know your, how to be published and it's really wonderful to know that people can reach out to you right from the get-go even mm -hmm. with just an idea to get yeah. there no that's wonderful thanks bev ryan thank you for having me thank you thanks for joining the simon filer podcast what's your story Contact them on for a chat at brisbaneaudiobookproduction.com.